Every year, Hamilton Native Outpost has a field day to share knowledge of native plants. Elizabeth Steele discussed biochar and soil health. This field day focused on grazing diverse native grasslands with livestock, but the information presented here can be useful to anyone interested in native plants and soil health. Elizabeth loves learning about plants and nature and has a master's degree in soil science. In the video description, check out other videos from the field day. Now we join the field day as Elizabeth starts talking about biochar. The other thing I wanted to touch on real quick is totally unrelated to everything we've touched on so far. And that's biochar. This has been a real interest of mine. Mom came dragging, in, dragging into the office the other day some statistics she had been reading from the textbook. Like 40 to 50% of the organic matter in a lot of these soils is biochar. <coughs> so what is biochar? Maybe we should step back and say, what is biochar? Basically, we've got little ash pieces or little charcoal pieces, let's just call them. Uh, you know, somewhere where the fire was and then it stopped. The combustion of that stopped. And so you've got a little charcoal. You know, if you took it and you rubbed it on your britches, you'd turn them all black like charcoal would. So basically, we've got little ends of grasses, ends of sunflower stems, ends of other things that are, that's, the combustion stopped there. And there's, in my further research on this, there's two types of compounds that contribute to this biochar. One of those is the soot biochar. And so like, you know, if you think of soot in your fireplace, it's the gases that, you know, are going up your flue and then they condense. And when they condense, you know, you've got this black stuff on the inside of your flue pipe now. So it's the same concept. These gases are in the air when the, there's that fire and then they condense and you get the soot biochar. The other type seems to be, they call it char biochar. And so that's when this smoldering occurs and you've got that you know, layer between burned and where the burned used to be and where the unburned is, that's that black stuff. So basically there wasn't enough oxygen there to burn that or maybe it was too wet alter alternately. So I don't know how useful this statistic was, but when you're learning things, you just kind of keep trying to put a little information in. That's what you do. So the maximum conversion rate of a grassland, so grasses, into biochar seems to be about 1.8% of the initial carbon that's out there turned into biochar. So almost 2%. Maybe, maybe 1%. Maybe it was less than ideal. So, you know, we're somewhere in that 1% to 2% neighborhood of that can turn into biochar. This happens at about 90% burn efficiency. So if we, in this, and these are all just studies that I was reading the papers of, so you know, different situations may prove different things, but um, it's fine, I don't need it anymore. What this study had found is that at 90% burn efficiency, so we consume 90% of the carbon, above ground carbon, above ground dead plant material from, you know, let's say in this winter, there's a fire that goes through here, 90% of that plant material is consumed. That's the most efficient conversion to biochar. At an 80% burn efficiency, it's only about a half of a percent conversion rate. So you go from 1.8% to a half a percent, just getting down to 80%, going from 90% burn efficiency to 80. If you get down to 70% or 100% burn efficiency, it's practically nothing. Now, you know, take and observe after a fire and see if you think this is true or not. This is what this study indicated. So what, why does it even matter that we have biochar in the soil? Well, I mean, as I said, it's part of that organic matter, and we all know organic matter is the sponge. It, um, it holds that moisture, those nutrients for those plants and those microbes to use. But this biochar is not very microbially degradable. The microbes really can't chew on it much, is my understanding of it. And so it's kind of a microbe hangout. That You know, there's this structure that the microbes can get into. Um, and it also ad absorbs the, some alleliopathic compounds, it appears. So alleliopathic, 
very appropriately, we're setting under a walnut tree. Walnuts produce a compound called juglone. Juglone, they, it, it's in the soil, and other plants don't like this compound called juglone. Uh, there's a few that do, um, but a lot of plants don't. And so this is an alleliopathic chemical that this tree is producing. Evidently, this biochar adsorbs some of that, those compounds like juglone, and makes them inactive. So it gives other plants the ability to grow here because those chemicals are not as active. So I thought that was an interesting function of it. It seems to be a really long term. This biochar seems to be really long term. It's highly resistant to microbial decomposition. And some models suggest that it might last different parts of it three to 870 years. So, I, you know, these were just models. They were doing predictions. I don't know enough about the science of biochar to know if they did good models or bad models. But nonetheless, it sounds like it's a very long-term organic matter substance. It also is interesting, it, um, its ability to kind of like hold on to nutrients for plants and microbes to use seems to wear out after a while. They said that for the first hundred years or so, it has the ability to hold on to these nutrients. And this ability can be reactivated by subsequent fires. They didn't go on to explain how this happened. Um, but again, I just found that to be an interesting component of it. So 40 to 50% of soil organic matter might be biochar. Soils that are subjected to continued burning comprise considerable amounts of biochar, as you might expect. Soils that historically would not have had many fires go across them don't have much biochar. But I, what I was reading is a lot of soils do have some bi amount of biochar, even if we don't associate fire with those ecosystems. So the dark color uh, of the prairies, you know, they do some tree ring cores and look at how often fires go through areas. I understand that on prairies it's variable, but these flat grasslands that you get like in western and maybe northern Missouri, maybe annual fires, maybe it wasn't that often. Um, and again, I'm pulling on other people's knowledge here. In the Ozarks, I don't know, somewhere between three and five years. If you get really steep slopes, maybe it was more like 50 years. So it really, de it's pretty variable here in the Ozarks as to how flat the landscape is and some factors. But, you know, that's a lot of fire going through these ecosystems. Even if it was only every five years, I suspicion that we could contribute a significant amount of biochar to those soils. So in the Amazon rainforest, the indigenous people there used to produce this, uh, they had these soils called terra preta. Some of you may have heard of that, but basically they would clear the trees and they would, this biochar, they would make these really infertile soils, very nutrient poor soils into very fertile soils through the use of this biochar, and I think maybe they've used some animal manures and whatnot as well. But biochars made the color of those soils go from, a lot of times these oxisols is what they're called, these soils that are highly weathered are very red color. They've taken the color of those from that red to a blackish color. And so it, it, from the infusion of that biochar. So we can take those very fertile soils and increase the organic matter, increase the phosphate and the nitrogen in those soils and make them, you know, into a whole different critter. So that's my enlightenment uh, or reading, I maybe I should say, on biochar and thoughts on just above ground, how these plants are stronger together than they are alone. In the video description, there are links to other talks from this field day. Justin Thomas shares his thoughts about how nature works. Lauren Steele discusses why a diversity of plants is good for livestock. Amy Hamilton looks below ground and speaks about how a diversity of root systems makes for a grassland that is stronger than a monoculture. And Colt Hamilton speaks about establishing a diverse native silvopasture or savanna.